T1112 on a patient with a disc herniation at T1112. It's an unusual place to have a disc herniation. Um, but let me show it to you nonetheless. It is right here. That's the herniation, the bulging out thing. And this gray thing here is the spinal cord. So you can see the herniation is really pushing up against the spinal cord and that's the T11 vertebral body and T12. So we're gonna be going in today and from both sides, we're going to be removing the herniation and decompressing the spinal cord. Now we haven't done many thoracic herniations with Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic transfer aminal surgery. This, we started doing them last year in 2020. This will be, I think our eighth one. Is that right? Are you awake? It's Dr. Duke Majin. We're gonna get started, okay? I need you to lay still. Our patient is awake. We're gonna put him to sleep shortly, but I need him awake. We're gonna put you to sleep in a little bit, but I need you awake for the very beginning. Okay. Now, I'm gonna give you some numbing medicine under your skin. It's gonna, it's gonna burn a little bit. You're gonna feel a little poke and a burn, okay? So don't try to move throughout the surgery. If you feel any pain, you let me know by saying, ouch. Deal? Yeah. If you say, ouch, then I'll give you some more medicine, okay? All right. We're going to get started. First thing I want to do is get a, an x-ray view shot to see. And this is where you localize to, shot? Yep. All right. So, shot. Well, that's pretty much uh, in line with the T1112 disc. And I could see some end plate changes at T11. So I'm going to give you some numbing medicine, okay? Sure. Don't get upset. But we're going to give you a little, a little prick, and um, you're going to feel the medicine go in. Don't be alarmed. And again. You're doing great, by the way. Everything is going perfect, okay? Are you comfortable enough? Yeah. All right. So we'll give that a minute to work, and then we'll get started. Now, for many people, the herniation is on one side or the other. But in some patients, it's on both sides. In the case of this patient, it's on both sides. So we need to attack the herniation from both sides. Remember to let me know if you feel discomfort, OK? Shot. And let's go lateral. So we're going to use we're going to use our X-ray machine to navigate to the disc. I want my patient awake. That way he can help me. And we know that we're at T eleven twelve because of the ribs. So. I can see the first rib there. Oh, just give me a second. And we'll hopefully get a better picture. Sean? I'm going to just give him a little bit of numbing medicine. Are you comfortable? All right, you're doing great. Just lay still and breathe nice and slow, and that's perfect for helping me, okay? So, just like with the lumbar spine, we're going to access the, the disc through a trans 
experimental approach. And shot. Okay. Now, let's see. 12, 11, shot. And the table, uh, sorry, the floral, where is the floral? All the way down? All right, we can probably drop the table just a half an inch. Just a half an inch is fine. That's good. Right there, no, that's fine. All right, so it looks like the first rib is coming off at that vertebrae. It looks like we're higher than we need to be. I may have to make an adjustment here. Shot. And let's go AP. Your lateral view is really nice, by the way. Um, you kind of have almost a double shadow of the ribs, which is really good. I think we're a little higher than we want to be, but I want to verify that with the AP. Yeah. All right. So I think we still have space down below with the numbing. We should be fine. Shot. And that's the disc we're aiming for, straight across. And that AP is actually a better view than before, but it's still not a true AP. Um, let's see if we can adjust it a little bit to make it better. John? That is better. That's definitely better. Are you comfortable? Good. Sean? Sean? Lateral? So how do we know where T12 is? Well, you can see the rib come in from the side. It's a dark thing, and it attaches to the pedicle, really the transverse process and pedicle of T12. So we know that bottom bone is 12. We know the one above has to be 11. The further down vertebrae doesn't have a rib. It's just got a transverse process. So we know that that one there is, um, that looks pretty good. You might feel a little bit of discomfort, shot. All right. Lining up nicely. Shot. And let's go for an AP view. So we're right at the facet joint of T1112. You can see the disc can actually see some modic changes on the end plates. They're darker at T1112 compared to the end plates of the vertebral bodies below and above. That's because the disc was blown out. There's some stress to the end plates now at T1112. As a result, that's perfect. Let's go back to a lateral view, please. So it's absolutely perfect trajectory. Couldn't ask for it to be better. Very fortunate. We're below the lung field. You doing all right? Okay. Shot. All right, let's get an AP. So we're right at the back of the bad disc. Do you feel anything? Huh? Pinch, good. That's fine, you're gonna feel a little pinch, that's normal. Everything's going really, really good for you so far. All right, that's perfect. You can see the tip of the needle is right at the medial border of the pedicle. 
That's as good as it gets. Doesn't get any better than that. So far, everything's going well for you. John, we're inside the disk now, a, a lateral view. And that's about as far in as I want to be. But by the way, if you're watching this surgery, you're watching history being made. Um, transforaminal endoscopic thoracic disc surgery has never been done except here at Duke Spine Institute. And we've now done, this is our, I believe our eighth case. Sean probably has a better idea. It's actually our ninth case at ninth this point. Ninth case. Thank you, Sean. We actually do have a question about thoracic DLDR in the audience. We have a question? Yes. From, um, I didn't hear the second part of the statement. It's a viewer on YouTube who's wondering about thoracic DLDR. Okay. They say that they have a T4-5 disc bulge and their current doctors have turned them away. Can DLDR fix that level? Yes. So once again, um, this is our ninth patient that we've ever done, that I've ever done, that's ever been done in the history of the world. And um, you doing okay? Yeah. All right. The answer is yes, we can do T4-5. I just need to see the MRI first before I can say that with 100% conviction. But um, yes, we shouldn't have a problem doing T4-5. All right, I need a little more numbing medicine. So we're done with one side. Um, we're gonna put the access the other side. And I wanna make sure that it's all numbed up really good. Are you feeling anything in your back? No. Right now, no? no? You might feel a little burn. I'm putting some more numbing medicine, okay? Everything's going really good for you. We're done accessing the one side and we're just getting ready to do the other. Okay? So I want to envision, you, and to be a surgeon, you really have to have good three-dimensional visualization. That's one of the requirements to be a good surgeon is to be able to visualize things three-dimensionally. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I think I'm a little higher than I should be. I may want to come down a little bit. You're doing great. Just relax. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Shot. All right. So I'm going to try to follow a similar trajectory. The cables are in the way. So let's move those. That's good right there. Shot. All right, so we got a little ways to go. Want to make sure he's comfortable. That's the fascia. I can feel the fascia, Sean. And I want to uh, numb that up because um, one of the things you learn as a surgeon is where pain fibers are. You see, pain fibers are how patients are able to feel pain. And pain fibers are nerve fibers. Nerves are the little wires in the body that transmit pain signals from a body part to the brain. And we learn where the pain fibers are. They're not everywhere, believe it or not. Um, that's the first thing you should know. They're not everywhere. Sean? They're only in very specific locations, and one of them is fascia, the, th the thoracic fascia. All right, so I'm trying to numb that up for him and make him more comfortable. Sean? Not entirely happy with that. Sean? I want to be a little bit lower. Shot. That's better. Let me know if you're feeling pain, okay, Sean? I can actually feel the fascia with this. And I don't want to go through it, Sean, until I'm sure of my trajectory. Right now, I got to look at my fluoro. I have to make sure I'm happy with my fluoro picture, which I'm not entirely happy with right now. So I think we need to wag a little bit. If your floral picture is not, that's better. 
if the floral picture is not perfect, I mean, as close to perfect as you can get it, obviously, then your um, trajectory won't be accurate. So I want to make sure that what I'm using to navigate is as close to perfect as we can get it. So that's one of the rules of navigation. If your navigation coordinates, if your navigation system is inaccurate, then of course your navigation will be inaccurate. All right, uh, I'm happy with that trajectory. I'm happy with that view. Give me an AP. And we'll come back to that lateral in just a minute. So there's no um, guessing with the navigation because there's too many sensitive structures. We want to be as accurate as possible. We need to use reliable navigational information. And reliable navigational information comes from um, the proper tools to navigate. And we talked about this earlier. Uh, you're a little bit off-centered because of the, but I think we're fine for now. But when you come back, try to get the spinous process a little bit more perfect, maybe a degree of rotation. But for right now, let's go back to a lateral. So navigation can only be as good as, as the tools and the information used to navigate, all right? And we're creating a map right now with this patient and the x-ray machine. Shot? Shot? Give me an AP. So if you're sailing a boat out in the middle of the ocean, you use the stars for reference before there was global positioning satellites. You would use the stars, you would use land features, islands, basically fixed points to navigate so you don't destroy your ship and kill your crew and jeopardize your mission. We do the same thing here in spine surgery is we use fixed points to navigate. And those fixed points are the spine and the tissues around the spine, but mostly the spine because that's what an x-ray machine will see. Go ahead and go lateral, that's perfect. So we're in absolutely perfect trajectory again. <coughs> you feeling all right? Yeah. I'm gonna put you to sleep in about three minutes, okay, yeah. doctor? Three minutes, we'll be ready to put him to sleep. When he's asleep, we're gonna finish the surgery. When you wake up, you'll be done. All right, so far everything is going really good. I'm very pleased. We've had no blood loss. All right. So we're at the second herniation. I can feel it with the tip of my needle. Do you feel anything in your back? Yeah. Is that where your pain comes from, your thoracic pain? Yeah. yeah, I'm right on the herniation. It's actually worse on the right side than the left for some reason. It's bigger here. We know it's asymmetric. Shot? All right. Are you comfortable? How many of my surgeries did you watch before you flew out here to have the surgery done? Huh? How many? I can't hear them. Pick a number. Let's get an AP real quick. Nine or ten? So you watched nine or ten of my laser surgeries before you made the decision to fly here and have, have me fix your back at Duke's spine, huh? And were you offered surgery in, in, uh, at home where you come from? Yes. What did he say? Yes. You were offered surgery. What kind of surgery? Fusion. fusion? Yes. A thoracic fusion? Yes. Perfect. Absolutely perfect needle position. All right.
We have another question. Well, before I answer the question, I want to ask my patient one more question. So somebody was willing to do a thoracic fusion and laminectomy on you? Yeah. Were they going to go through the back or through the, through the front? Yeah. Through the front? Yeah. Through the back? Yeah. Hmm. You can't fix the herniated disc through the back, except for the way that I'm doing it from the fer through the foramen. So I don't know what they were going to do, but how many days were you going to be in the hospital? Two weeks? That's about right for a, uh, for a thoracic decompression infusion, but it sounds like they were going to go, okay, so they were going to go through the back and they were going to go around the side. They were probably going to do what's called a lateral extracavitary approach or a transpedicular approach, right? You're, you're an engineer, you're pretty smart, so you know, you probably heard those terms before, right? All right, so I'm going to show you folks in a minute what a lateral extracavitary approach means. It's pretty horrific. They have to peel his entire muscles off his spine and pull it to the side, and then they have to destroy all the bone in the back of the spine, remove it to create a huge hole to try to get the herniation out. So we're doing this endoscopically with the Duke laser disc repair. It can only be done here in Florida at this time. All right. You ever get pain up in this area? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You feel it now? Yeah. Is that the pain you typically get? Yeah. I can't hear him. Yeah. How bad did that go on a scale of one to 10? What's the worst it got? A nine? A nine? All right, I got some good news for you, my friend. You're gonna wake up and that will be gone for the rest of your life as long as you don't re-injure it. You can count from one to 100 out loud. You can count in Spanish or English, whatever you prefer. When you wake up, we'll be done. Let's get a lateral. So folks, we just did our discogram at T1112. You can see the die is in the T1112 disc and we are going to be doing a lateral view just to capture that as well. Our count out loud. Our patient is being put to sleep right now. And the way we put our patients to sleep is with something called propofol sedation. Wow, look at the tear in the back. Look at the tear in the back of that disc just bulging out into the spinal canal up against the spinal cord. So literally we're operating at the level of the spinal cord. And once again, transforaminal endoscopic surgery, the first in the world here at Duke Spine Institute. This is our ninth case, our ninth patient. We've been doing it now for over a year and we've had zero complications and we've had one drop of blood loss basically per patient, one or two drops and no hospitalization. This is an outpatient surgery. The patient will go home today. Once again, this surgery is developed uh, by Dr. R. Duke Majin, me. And I'm not advertising, I'm just giving you facts, in case you're wondering. Um, and it's only done here in, in Florida at this time. I'm sure there'll be people trying to copy me, and that's fine. As long as they do a good job, I'm happy. Um, but it's pretty remarkable. The patient was also offered surgery elsewhere, a fusion, and with a massive transpedicular or lateral extracavitary extra transpedicular approach where they would literally, uh, can you guys see this, Sean? Uh, let me see, yes, we can. And I'm gonna show you the disc we're fixing. It's right here. It's, you know, T11, T12, T1112, we call it, because there's a, a bone above it called the T11 vertebral body. That's number 11, and there's a bone below it called the T12 vertebral body, okay? And then you get into the lumbar spine down here, down below. So to fix this herniation the old-fashioned way, which is a very difficult surgery to do, I've done them in the past, and the patients are in the hospital for two weeks, and it's a life-threatening surgery. 
the patients usually will die or end up with major complications about 20% of the time, one in five. And it involves screws and rods and cages. So normally the incision would be from here, you guys see this up here, down to about here. Okay, that would be the normal incision. And the whole muscle, the muscle that runs down the side of the spine right here has to be peeled off of the spine and pulled over, way over to here so that the surgeon can go this way, transforaminal, transpedicular. The bones in the back of the spine would be removed back here, taken out, osteotomized. And that would, then the spinal cord, which sits, the spinal cord sits right here, okay? This is the spinal cord. You can't touch it as a surgeon. If you touch the spinal cord, you could cause a spinal fluid leak if you tear the membrane on the outside, or you could, uh, paralyze the patient from the waist down all right so you're not allowed to touch the spinal cord during surgery of the anywhere near the spinal cord all right so that goes up 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 to the brain okay so we're going on the side of the spinal cord on both sides and we're removing the herniation that's pushing on the spinal cord on both sides make sense we had a question So one of our patients is wondering, they see that you keep them awake for the first part of the surgery. What is your procedure to do if there is no pain during the discogram? Shot. So the question is, what, it, what is the procedure to do if there's no pain during the discogram? All right. Is that the question? Yes, it is. Great. First of all, if there's, if you're doing surgery like this for pain and there's no pain in the discogram, then your surgeon probably picked the wrong disc to fix. So that's really bad. We've never done that here at Duke Spine, ever. That's just careless. So I'm not gonna talk about that except that it's careless. But I do want you to understand something. We're not doing this surgery for pain. He does have pain and it's coming from the herniated disc at T11-12. But that's not why he's having the surgery done. He's having the surgery done because the spinal cord is getting crushed. In the front of the spinal cord, a herniation that goes from side to side is pushing up against the spinal cord. We're gonna go in there and remove the herniation on both sides. So nothing is pushing on the spinal cord anymore. So we're not doing a pain surgery today, folks, even though we are gonna fix his pain, we're doing a decompression surgery shot. I don't get the two mixed up. Decompression means to get the pressure off the spinal cord or nerves, and a pain surgery shot is to uh, fix someone's pain. So I'm looking for my guide wire shot. You wanna make sure you're in far enough with your guide wire shot, but you don't wanna go too far, obviously. There it is, you see it, right? I see it. So now we're, we know the front of the guide wire is where we want it, so I'm gonna take the leave the guide wire there and take the needle out shot and i'm going to keep checking to make sure that i haven't moved how's our blood pressure good perfect i'm going to make sure i haven't moved the guide wire shot that's it all right that's perfect so here we come out with the needle shot guide wire is still in place you could see it was the top one and it's much skinnier than the bottom right on the fluoro the bottom is the needle, the top is the guide wire. Guide wires are always skinnier than needles. So, our blood pressure is good. I worry about that because you want to make sure that you're not going to have high blood pressure and get a hematoma. Anybody ever hear of a hematomato? <laughs> I knew I could get you to laugh at something. All right, so here's the most incredible thing. We're doing the whole surgery through a four millimeter cut. Do you understand what that means? four a four millimeter incision it's remarkable to fix this disc endoscopically with a four millimeter incision okay as a matter of fact i'm going to show you the tube that we're going to use to fix the herniation this is it right here you see this sean yes the whole surgery will be done endoscopically through a tubular retractor 
This is not a percutaneous surgery. I don't call it percutaneous because it's percutaneous procedures are done through needles. So we're not doing this through a needle. We're doing it through a tubular retractor. So it's a real surgery with a real incision and it's gonna s save this patient's life, I'm hoping, because had he gone for the hospital surgery with a huge incision, like I told you, it's a one in five chance of serious complication, even death, okay? I'm gonna bring my dilator down. I'm up against the fascia right now. I can feel it. I wanna make sure I don't pinch the guide wire and drag it forward into the thoracic cavity, which would be bad form shot, okay? So I'm gonna keep getting x-rays, but I know I have a safe path because I created a safe path. That was the hard part of the surgery earlier, creating a safe path. So I've done the safe path and now I just need to re-follow the same path I took before. And that's what I'm doing. I'm re-following that same path, okay? And that's the magic of this surgery, is you carefully find a path that's safe, and then you just follow it over and over again until the surgery is done. And that's what I'm doing. So. Let's verify on AP that we're at T1112. Once again, we're right in the foramen, just lateral to the spinal cord. And I'm about, and I can feel the herniation, by the way, with the tip of that dilator. It's, in, it's pushing into the, the front of the spinal cord right there. Yeah, we're good. So let's just verify. All right, so we're in the lateral part of the disc right now. It's very nice. Let's go back to a lateral view. So we're, we're away from the spinal cord. The spinal cord comes up against the medial border of the pedicle. The medial border of the pedicle, okay? That's that round thing you're seeing above and below the tip of the dilator. So you know if you're lateral to the medial border of the pedicle, you're safe, you're safe. And that's where we are, we're safe. We're not gonna injure his spinal cord, but boy, there's a herniation here. I can feel it shot. All right. Pushing through it, actually reducing it back into the disc space. I'm using my fingers and I'm controlling the movement as much as I can to be safe for the patient. Shot. I'm inside the, the tear of the disc at this point, just starting to go in the disc. Let's get one more AP, just to look. I'm gonna remove the guide wire. I'm gonna advance the dilator using the mallet. I'm gonna use, what happened? Controlled, spilly spilly? I'm gonna use controlled bursts of energy to deliver the dilator into the disc. We're just going through the herniation and look at that. We're right at the medial border of the pedicle. It's perfect. All right, back to a lateral. Because the tip of the dilator is the medial border pedicle, that means I'm just lateral to the spinal cord. I'm as close to the spinal cord as I can get safely. I'm below the exiting nerve root of T11 and I'm above the shoulder of the next root that will exit at T12. So I'm below the T11 nerve root on the left. I'm above the T12 nerve root shoulder so I'm in something called Cambin's Triangle. Cambin's Triangle. Cambin, Parvis Cambin was the first endoscopic spine surgeon, surgeon in the world out of Pittsburgh. He was a true genius and a, and a uh, pioneer. And we all build on his, some of his legacy, just like people will build on my legacy someday. Okay. Shot. We have another question. Shot. Sure. We have a viewer from YouTube who's wondering, so when you remove the herniated portion of the disc with the laser, how does the disc fill back in? Will there be less disc afterwards? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll repeat it. When I remove the herniated portion of the disc, will the disc fill back in afterwards or will there just be less, less disc? Shot. The answer is, though, we're not removing any of the normal disc, period. 
The only thing we're removing is a piece of the jelly, the disc, that already left. So imagine you have a tube of toothpaste. You forgot to put the cap on, and you inadvertently put your hand down on the toothpaste, and you squeezed out a little bit of toothpaste, right? That's the situation that I'm dealing with. I need to remove the toothpaste that's squeezed out. There's no filling it back up, and we're not removing toothpaste from the toothpaste bottle or tube. All we're doing is taking the stuff that's already squeezed out away. So this surgery doesn't remove shot disc material from the disc. It removes herniated disc from the herniation. Shot. All right, we got, uh, it's looking good. I want to get an AP. And what happens is that that jelly is gone forever once it left the disc center when the herniation first occurred. So I didn't create the herniation, the patient did. The herniation is the jelly from the center squeezed out through the tear or the opening in the disc that was created through trauma and now, back to a lateral, now I am removing the jelly that is squeezed out uh, through the tear. That's my job, that's what I do. That's what the Duke Laser Disc Repair is. So we're not taking jelly away from the disc, we're taking the jelly that already left the disc away because it's in a place it shouldn't be. How's he doing, doctor? Shot? All right, you can see the tubular retractor over the dilator there. It's looking good. <clears throat> We're at the base of the herniation. We're going to take the dilator out, and we're going to get started. Let's get one. Well, is that our last shot right there? That's it? Perfect. All right, so this patient is having both sides repaired of his disc because he has a both side herniation. We call it bilateral in medicine. Bilateral means both sides. And we're doing both sides today. That was his request. Um, and that's what I'm honoring is his request. All right, very good. So uh, wait. Wait, what's that? Okay. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. That should be okay, right? Lights on, please. I mean, not lights on. Go on. And end up here. All right, folks. We're going to go into the disc now with the laser and the scope. And here we are inside the disc. Now it's a little hazy because I have to focus it, but that is part of the herniation right there. I'm going to get a better focus. I think that's a little better. Hey, Sean, I'll be done in 20 minutes. Can you make sure I have some coffee? All right, so Absolutely. I'm going to grab some of the herniation out. You can see what we're doing here, Sean. Come back to the eye in the sky. Watch the scope. So, oh, yeah. A lot of the herniation we have to debulk, it's called debulking by going in with a grabber made out of stainless steel with a little mouth that bites. <laughs> Anybody see the new Nicolas Cage movie? Willy, Willy something? No. no? I tell you, Nicolas Cage has made some interesting movies in the last 10 years. I like Nicolas Cage. Personally, I like him a lot, um, but he's made some pretty crazy movies, wouldn't you say? Anybody follow Nicolas Cage? Am I the only one? No, Are you I kidding? Like yeah, yeah. But I think I'm stuck in the... Huh? The, uh, Snake Eyes? Snake Eyes? Is that a movie? Yeah. Raising Arizona. That's an oldie, man. That's like super old. That's one of his first movies. 
Why not? It's a great movie. Oh, isn't there like a Shanghai, Shanghai Dangerous? Have you seen that one? Is it called Shanghai Dangerous? That's an amazing movie. Really good. All right. Still some herniation there. It wouldn't come out with the grabber, so we're going to go in after it with the laser. I have a pedal. Are we ready to go? Are we on 20? Yes, we are. All right. So now we're going to debulk this herniation using uh, the laser. I've turned back the power just a little bit compared to the lower back, and I'm getting it now with the, with the laser. This is all herniated disc right here. And I pushed it back into the disc so that I could get it out safely from inside the disc. I pushed it in there with the dilator. Does that make sense? That's kind of a big piece right there. A lot of times these herniated fragments don't come out with the grabber. You gotta, you gotta free them up first with the laser and then try to pull them out with the grabber. If you have to sit there and laser all the herniated fragments, it would just take forever. It drags the surgery on, it's not good for the patient. So you want to try to free them up with the laser and then remove the chunks with the grabber. I'm just not happy with the amount of uh, play I have in the cables. You have to be patient if you're going to do this kind of surgery. You can't just rush. There's no rushing. It's too delicate of a surgery to rush. So, and Once again, we use cold irrigation, refrigerated, because I want to keep the tissues cool so there's no thermal damage other than right where the laser pulse is. We are inside the T1112 disc, really inside the herniation, once again. And I'm debulking it right now, debulking it. That's what I'm doing. We debulk tumors and we debulk herniations. Herniation is a type of tumor. Tumor means a mass. Uh, in tr pure Latin, true Latin, it means swelling, which is a mass. If you have a pimple, and it's swollen and angry, it is two more, swelling, mass. Inflammatory lesions have four characteristics. They're all Latin, two more, which is swelling, rubor, which is red, dolor, which is pain, and two more, dolor, rubor, calor. Calor means hot. Why are they hot? Why are tumors hot? Why are inflammatory lesions hot? Because of the increased blood supply to those areas. You know, the more blood supply a tissue has, the warmer it's going to be. Right? Because blood is hot. You know, how does blood get hot? Anybody know? I know my anesthesiologist probably knows. Hypermetabolic. Hyper <laughs> it's cute. Of course, it's from metabolism. But where? What is the heater? What is the human heater? Does anybody know? You must know. Huh? Muscle. Muscle. Muscle is the heater. The muscle is the heater. Our blood and our bodies are heated by our muscles, skeletal muscle. How is that possible? Most people don't know. It's a biochemical process. It involves the electron transport chain in the mitochondrial wall. See, normally the electron transport chain converts chemically stored energy in the form of 
uh, high energy electrons into in, uh, intermediaries, energy intermediaries like NADH, FADH2. However, if you uncouple that process, then you take the energy of the high energy electrons and it produces heat instead from uh, just like current will produce heat, electric current with high resistance. Electricity passing through a high resistance cable will create heat. Same way that the body produces heat in muscles because of decoupling of the electron transport chain from production of high energy intermediates. Anyway, long story short, that's what uh, malignant hyperthermia is, is you get a, a, the muscles basically go crazy, right? Producing heat. And you have to administer dantrolene to stop it. Well, the brain doesn't like heat. Yeah. Uh, so we're in this disc. We're removing, we're zapping away pieces of the herniation right here. And it's, uh, it's a process. So to pass the time, we talk about medicine and, and other interesting things. So the heat that you feel during inflammation, if you have a zit on your face or an area of inflammation like a, a cyst that's inflamed, like a sebaceous cyst, for example, the, that heat is produced in the muscles and it's, it's brought to that area of inflammation by the circulation, by your blood circulation. It's, it's brought, brought to that area by, by blood. So why is an uh, inflamed area more, more, got more blood? Because these chemicals called cytokines act on the endothelial, skeletal, smooth muscle and open up uh, blood flow to that area of the body, that tissue, and allow more blood flow to that area. So it's mediated by inflammatory mediators released from endothelial cells and mast cells, inflammatory cells that um, promote blood flow to that little area of the body where the inflammation is. And that increased blood flow is what increases the temperature. Okay? Pretty cool. Unfortunately, a lot of medical students these days don't learn, thank you, but we some of the basics. So I want to teach while I have an opportunity to. All right. So we're going to pull back just a little bit. And you can see all this jelly from the herniation. The only type of disc that stains blue is disc, jelly disc called nucleus propulsus that is damaged and degenerated. So if it's staining blue, it's, it's damaged and degenerated and should be removed, okay? You don't have to remove all of it, but you wanna debulk it because that's gonna be swollen and it's gonna be causing compression by its swelling, compression. Any questions? There are none others currently. No questions? Correct. All right. So if you're watching this surgery, you're watching the laser in action. This is endoscopic spine surgery, specifically Duke laser disc repair is the name of the procedure. And I am removing a herniation at the same time I'm debriding an annular tear where the herniation came from. The herniation came from, the jelly in the herniation came from the center of the disc and it was released through a tear, a tear in the outer wall of the disc called the annulus fibrosis, okay? Annulus fibrosis caused, allowed the jelly from the center of the disc to leak out. 
So I am in the process right now of um, removing the herniated material, which is the blue stuff, but also um, cleaning up the tear so that it will heal on its own. I can't heal tissues. Surgeons can't heal tissues. Only the body can heal tissues, the human body. So this patient needs to heal this injury himself. But I can, I can help his body heal by removing the foreign body, which is the herniation. That herniated disc is the foreign body that's preventing his own body from being able to heal this problem on its own. Does that make sense? So I'm just helping him do what his body wants to do on its own. See, most 99.999% of spine surgeons don't understand that. They really don't. I hate to say it. They just don't understand it. They don't understand the true role they play in the healing of a patient. We, even when we do a fusion, we don't actually fuse. I don't know if people are aware of that. We, we instrument, but we don't fuse. Surgeons say, oh, I did a fusion, but they actually didn't do a fusion. They put the tissues in place to fuse on their own. We need more light. I need an upclick of one. One. It's a little darker than I want it to be. Just go up one. Heat it. More? We're not doing anything, guys. No, you're not. It's the wrong one. There we go. Yeah, I think that's better. Let's try a little more. One more. Yeah, one more. That should be good. All right. So I'm now pulling my way back. And so fusion, when a surgeon says I did a fusion, they didn't actually do a fusion. They, they basically decorticated the bones that are already there, setting them up to fuse. And they, uh, they put bone graft there to set it up to fuse. But the fusion itself is where the two bones grow together. And that takes three to six months. It happens after the surgery is done. And it only happens uh, if the patient's body makes it happen. So a surgeon, that's why you get a failed fusion sometimes in patients, because the surgeon did everything they could do to fuse the bones, but ultimately it's up to the patient to fuse their bones together. So the problem I'm having here is I need a blue towel that goes down into the bag, okay, that carries the water from here down past this lip that's getting pushed together by my waist and blocking the flow of water into the bag. Does that make sense? So again, I'm bringing my tube further back. As I do that, I'm removing the herniation a little bit at a time. You can see there's still a considerable amount left, especially on both sides actually. It's not just one side. And I'm gonna have to address that by rotating my scope and zapping that herniation out. But what I was getting at, for those of you following me, is that I'm not healing this disc. I'm merely setting the disc up to be healed by the patient. I'm helping the patient heal their own disc. That's what this surgery is all about. It's not a miracle surgery, it is just getting rid of the thing that is blocking the disc from healing itself, okay? And that is the nuclear material called interposed nucleus propulsus, okay? That's what I'm fixing. And I'm getting rid of that, interposed nucleus propulsus. If I remove that interposed nucleus propulsus, that allows the annular tear to heal, but I still need to do a debridement 
if you don't debride the annular tear, it won't heal. It's just got too much grunge in it to heal on its own. So I have to help it heal by removing um, not just the interposed nuclear material, but also debriding the annular tear itself. And that whole process of removing the p edge of the annulus so it will heal, removing the nuclear material that's wedged in there, that is called the annular debridement. And that's what makes this surgery so unique from all other surgeries, is that this is the only surgery in the world that does that. Now, of course, there are surgeons watching me do the surgery now. I see from China, for example, and it won't be long before they're copying what I do. And that's fine. That's why we do the broadcast so other people can learn the technique, okay? But the reality is it all started here, and I know eventually other people will start doing it, and that's fine. They just have to make sure they credit me for this discovery. That's the right thing to do in the science world, the medical world. All right, just about done. With my side, the right, the patient's left side, I'm standing on the patient's left side and I'm probably got five more minutes on this side. We have a question that came in through our app. Sure. The question reads from the viewer on the app who's wondering, Dr. Duke, in your years of doing spine surgery, have you ever been able to identify certain precipitating events that cause spinal herniations and injuries? Uh-huh. All right, it's a good question. So one of our viewers is saying, in all those years that you've been treating spine injuries, have you found any kind of events that precipitate the injury to the spine? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I think, first of all, all, all of these injuries come from an injury to the disc. Okay, now of course there's fractures of the spine too, but I'm not talking about spinal fractures. I'm just talking about the most common injury to the spine is, is which is a herniated disc. So there are many different conditions that affect the discs, right? You go on the internet, you can find them. Herniated disc, bulging disc, ruptured disc, degenerated disc, slipped disc, extruded disc. You know, there's so many different adjectives, but what I've discovered is they all have the same anatomical basis, and that is a tear in the annulus fibrosis. There's a tear in the containment system for the disc, and that containment system is literally called the annulus fibrosis, okay? And so that tear is the start of everything. Every single degenerated disc, bulging disc, herniated disc in the world comes from a tear. Now, the question is, what causes the tear? And the answer is trauma, trauma. That's the proximal cause of that tear, trauma. Whether it's doing a backflip, whether it's hitting and reaching and hitting a tennis ball, whether it's golfing injury, doesn't matter what the cause, some type of a injury to the annulus requiring a, a trauma gymnastics, golf, you know, kickboxing, you name it, any sport, motor vehicle accidents are common causes of traumatic injuries to the disc. Very common, okay? Car accident. Now, why don't everybody get problems with their discs? The answer is there's also a genetic component to it. And the genetic component is the component that determines how strong your disc is, specifically how strong the annulus fibrosis is. Because the jelly, I don't think, varies, at least it probably does, but not, not in this discussion, in terms of its inflammatory potential. Okay, let's just assume the jelly, the nuclear material is the same for everybody, which I don't think is the case, by the way, but for this discussion. the 
the herniation cannot occur without an annular tear. The symptoms cannot occur from a herniated disc without an annular tear. The annular tear is the initial and focal and most important event. And it's always traumatic, always traumatic. So an annular tear gives rise to herniations and bulges and degeneration of the disc, period. Now the uh, potential for that herniation to cause symptoms, well, that depends on a lot of other factors. Most importantly, just how much inflammation is going on, all right? Oh, there's a piece of herniation right there. Beautiful. Try to zap it away. See that, folks? I put a little pressure and it squeezed into the cavity that we're using to remove the herniations. So we're doing a good job. Everything's going well. A lot of scar tissue. This injury is, is some, some age old. I don't know how old he, his injury is, to be honest with you. I don't know when this injury occurred. But Great question so far. The herniation here is good size, so it is taking me a fair amount of time to remove it. And we're not done by any means. There's still more. Okay, there's still more. And I'm not going to leave this... Uh, until it's until I feel I've done everything I should do that I want to do in terms of the amount that I'm removing. I'm not going to remove every last piece because that's not going to be possible to do. There are even this is an endoscopic view, but he's moving a little bit. You're doing great. Everything's okay. Two years old, but that is that his thoracic or a lumbar? You want me to stop and wait? You want me to wait? Dr. Pettit, you need me to wait? Just lay still. You're doing great. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're getting to the outer part of the disc where there are more pain fibers, so he's going to be more responsive. He's got an itchy nose. All right. Is he comfortable then? Yeah. All right. As long as you're happy, I'm happy. He's not moving so much as bothering me, but I, uh, I want him to be comfortable. All right. Again, I'm pulling out a little bit, and eventually we'll be done. And we're not far from being done. But as I was saying, I want to make sure that we get everything we need to get treated here. So he has a great result. Sean, was there another question? None of those currently. The reason it's hard to see, folks, is there's actually small pieces of disc material in the water from the vaporization and breaking up of the disc herniation. And that's why it's obscuring your view a bit and mine, of course. I'm seeing the same thing you are. So we had some spine surgeons watching earlier for our last case from China. I wonder if they're still watching. Any idea? Sean? Are they still out there? Because if they are, they're, they're endoscopic surgeons like me. 
and they were asking me some questions about the preservation of my scope and how we keep it from being injured during surgeries. And sometimes it's challenging because, yeah? Uh, we do have a question now. You have a question, all right. Yeah, we have a viewer who's asking, um, since you aren't removing everything, uh, will the spine be close to normal after his recovery, even with the remaining amount uh, staying in his spine? Yeah. Well, well, let me ask you a question. If you have a toothpaste bottle, tube, and you squeeze out, you know, one tenth or ten percent of the toothpaste is the bottle going to be normal when you're done right it's kind of a philosophical question what's normal is normal mean like full a hundred percent no it won't be full a hundred percent is it normal for a toothpaste tube to lose toothpaste in the course of its life cycle hundred percent it's full of toothpaste. People need toothpaste to brush their teeth. So it's natural and normal to lose the toothpaste out of the tube because that's part of its purpose. Now, losing jelly from the middle of your disc is not normal, so to speak. It's not normal. It is natural and it is common. Will that have an effect on the function or performance of the disc? The answer is most likely no. Um, but this surgery you're watching now gives the disc the best chance of being normal because the only other surgeries that are done are fusions for this kind of problem. And a fusion takes away the movement of the disc 100%. Your disc is totally abnormal after a fusion, which is the alternative surgery. Plus, of course, your bones and joints in your spine are all abnormal too, because you removed all of them, the ligaments and bones and joints in order to, to do the fusion. So there's nothing normal about a fusion alternative, but there is the potential for being normal after the laser. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the best I can do for you. Just about done here. I know it seems like we've moved a great distance since we started, but in reality, we've moved a very small amount. But we re we've removed, we've moved a small amount, but we've removed a large amount of the herniation. We have another question. Sure. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, after the surgery, uh, can the patient go back to normal activities such as lifting weights? So great question. After the surgery, can the patient go back to normal activities such as lifting weights? The answer is yes, but not right after surgery. This patient and every patient that has the laser surgery needs time to heal. They, they have to heal. I cannot heal the patient. Remember I said that earlier, okay? I can, I can remove the herniation, I can clean the annular tear, but I cannot heal the patient, okay? So the actual healing requires time and the disc itself must heal. Um, that, that's the body healing the disc. It's not the surgeon healing the disc, it's the body healing the disc. So. The uh, uh, normal activities after surgery like this, I would recommend waiting one full year, one full year, 12 months. In that first 12 months, I would definitely recommend light duty, light weight, nothing over, certainly nothing over 40 pounds at most. That would be the highest amount of lifting I would ever recommend uh, in the first year. After a year, can the patient go back to doing normal activities? Yes. Is the patient at higher risk than somebody without a disc injury with a normal disc for having a recurrent disc herniation or re-injuring the disc? Yes. 
even when this patient lets the disc heal completely, he's still only going to have 85% of the normal disc strength that a normal disc would have. That's the best that we can do. All right, just about done. It's taken a lot longer than I thought, and that's fine. But I want to make sure we get it right. There's a lot of scar tissue in this outer part of the herniation because there's more blood supply here, right? So I, I want to, uh, to make sure we get it. And then we're going to move to the other side. very scarred up. All that scarring happened before I got here, obviously. Great questions from our audience, by the way. the getting to the end of the the disc herniation right here the outermost part I know it's hard to visualize and understand for some people but this is um, the surface of the disc the surface of the disc so to speak and you can see that we've removed the herniation below the surface a lot of people don't understand the anatomy of a herniation, but a herniation is not just a piece of disc that's sticking out. There's actually a base, just like an iceberg. And that base can be quite big, the part under the water, under the surface. And that's what we're dealing with, unfortunately, even with, with all herniations. We have another question. Sure. One of our viewers from Facebook is wondering, is there any chance that laser surgery can damage the spinal cord? Is there any chance that laser surgery can damage the spinal cord? 100% yes, chance. Yep, could damage it, but we, uh, we don't want to. And is there any chance that regular surgery could damage the spinal cord? Yes, even higher than laser surgery done by me. So any surgery can damage the spinal cord. But here's the real kicker for whoever asked. What do you think is happening right now if we don't do surgery? The spinal cord is already being damaged by the herniation. So I'm basically stopping the herniation from damaging the spinal cord. What if we didn't do the surgery? Then the spinal cord would be damaged even more by the herniation. This herniation would make this patient paralyzed without me doing any surgery. Disc herniations uh, cause paralysis. It happens all the time. Yep. So the, the greatest risk of par paralyzing this patient is not treating them, not doing surgery. The lowest risk of paralyzing them is doing the right surgery, which is what he's getting right now. The very best. The very best in the world. Yep. All right, just about done. I know I've said that several times, but uh, this time I really do mean it. My anesthesiologist is laughing at me, and he should be, because I keep thinking I'm done, and then I find more, right? And you know how that is. I'm not the first surgeon that's done that.
Zeke doing good? All right. So last few zapped, I think I'm right at the surface of the disk. And that's what it looks like to me. And uh, <coughs> then I'm going to head over to the opposite side. There's some herniation right there, right on the surface, sticking out. Yeah, please do. This stuff is really hard, by the way, right here. It's been uh, under the influence of inflammation for a long time, I can tell, because of all the scar tissue and the golden, the golden color stuff is calcium deposits. Here's a piece of herniation right there. the never-ending disc herniation, right? It's a big one. Huh? Yeah, debulking. Now, the more I can get out, the better for the patient. You are correct. Yeah, well, he wanted both sides done, and yeah. He's an engineer. He's a pretty smart guy, so he knows what he wants. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Who am I to argue with my patients, you know? All right, that's it. We're done. We're just outside the disc now. You can see the fat in the foramen right there, some blood vessels and stuff. So we're done. All right. Just get this. It's so grungy. Yeah, we're outside the disc now. Now we've done everything I can do. I think it will be a good result. And we're going to go to the other side. So you saw how I worked it from the inside out. Again, that's not my, that's what a technique I use, but I can't lay claim to it. That was Dr. Uh, Anthony Young who developed that technique. You ready? ready sir. Pressure? Yep. Mm. And we're done with that side. Let's go to the other side. I'm going to switch with Luis, and we're going to get the patient's right side done. All right, let me hold it, and you go to the other side. Go ahead, bring the floral in. Yep, let me have it. Go ahead. All right, so this is a T1112 endoscopic transforaminal discectomy and Duke laser disc repair. The proper terminology for the procedure is Duke laser disc repair. It's a one of a kind surgery. There's no other surgery like it. It's not described by any other surgery because it's unique. It fits into the general category of endoscopic spine surgery, which fits into the general category of endoscopic surgery, which fits into a gen more general category of surgery. So as we drill down into what this is, it is surgery, it's spine surgery, it's endoscopic spine surgery, and more specifically, it's the Duke laser disc repair endoscopic spine surgery. So we've just finished the T1112 
disc repair on the left. We're going to start the right side now. We've already placed my needle. This is my safety path shot. So now I'm going to remove the uh, needle shot. Make sure the guide wire is still there. It is. And then I'm going to use the guide wire to safely enter the disc herniation. By the way, one of the nice things about this surgery is quite literally, I, um, I go into the disc, not in a normal part of the disc, like you would with an ACDF or a thoracic discectomy. I go in right through the tear. That's the bad part. So we're entering the disc in the part of the disc that's already damaged. So we're not creating any collateral damage. Shot? How you doing, Doc? Is he okay? Yep. All right, so everything looks good for me there. Hopefully you're happy. Okay, shot. I feel the herniation. We're right on it. I'm going to try to push the herniation back into the disc as I did on the other side, gently and very carefully to get it reduced. It's called a reduction, reduction, reduction shot. I'm not talking about reducing a sauce like a saucier would. We're talking about reducing something that's sticking out of place. And in surgery, we call that a reduction shot. All right, that's looking pretty good. Take. Shot. Yep, take it. Once again, the whole surgery is being done with a tube. You see this, Sean? It's got a four millimeter diameter, four millimeters. Okay, everybody see the metal straw? We can see it. It's called a tubular retractor. And uh, we made a four millimeter skin incision on each side. And I'm doing the surgery through two four millimeter skin incisions shot. We're right on the back of the disc. I'm going to need to advance the tubular retractor into the disc at this point. Shot. Again, pu shot. Pushing things forward. Shot. Makes it easier to take them out. Done. So at this point, all we have left is to complete, you can close that too when you get a chance, is to complete the right side T1112 and then we'll be done. Let's get the fluoro out. Luis is gonna put a Band-Aid on the other incision basically and we're gonna be finished hopefully in the next 15 minutes. We do have one more surgery today and it is a Lumbar, Duke laser disc repair. Lumbar means lower back. All right, let me have the rig. Any questions from our audience? None currently. So what I need is, see this blue towel goes down into the bag. That way all the water tracks through the towel down into the bag. All right. Luis has been a tremendous help. Yes. Scope, on, Scope, Scope on, on, folks. I need to see that panel. I need to see that panel. I need you to turn the panel. All right. There it is. So first thing I'm going to do is try to take some of that herniation out with a, my grabber rather than just zapping it with a laser. Some big pieces. I can feel them. They don't want to come out, though. They're stuck in there. There's a piece. It's not so big, though. A few millimeters each one. Unfortunately, herniations don't come out easily. They, um, they're stuck down because of the inflammation and the scarring to the surrounding ligaments and annulus and end plates. Take it. Got a few pieces there. 
hopefully enough to get us started. We're going to bring our endoscope and laser back in. And there we go. So, all right, where's my pedal? Where's my pedal? My pedal should be right here, guys, where my foot is. Thank you. It's nicely done. A little bit overexposed on the uh, light. Let's bring it down a notch or two. It's way too bright. That's fine. No, no, you're good. You're good. Right there is fine. So once again, herniation. Oh, look at that right there. It just erupted. That's called a reverse herniation because it's going from a place where it's not supposed to be within the, uh, usually within the annular fibers or epidural space. There is a call coming in. Please take it. There's a call coming in. Are you not hearing the phone ring? We need that phone answered. It's the only way the nurses communicate with us in recovery. Did, the, did we get that? Who's calling? I'm sorry? Is it somebody that wants to uh, extend my warranty on my car? That's probably an important call, right? Was it pre-op or post-op? There's another herniation right there. A big one jiggling around. Pretty good view though, huh? Endoscopically, more herniation. It's not bad. Now this is a um, different scope than the one used for lumbar. This is a fiber optic scope. It's not a rod lens scope. Fiber optic scopes are more durable, but they're thinner. And because they're thinner, the, um, the reality is, is that the thin shaft of the fiber optic scope, I mean, it needs to be thin because we're doing a thinner area of access. So we need a skinnier endoscope. But the problem is if you use a rod lens system, any kind of bending of the shaft would result in the, um, that's a big herniation right there. Any kind of um, bending of the shaft, as I'm trying to get in there and get, see things and do things, I'll be bending the shaft. And then any kind of bending of the shaft will result in the, the lenses popping out of place. So, Fiber optic doesn't have lenses to pop out of place. It's fiber optic. It has fibers. Like, I think there are 5,000 fibers, as a matter of fact. Either 5,000 or 500. I can't remember the number. And the picture is not as clear because it's not a rod lens system. You don't use a lens. You're using a, a bunch of little tubes that transmit light information or visual information rather than using the the rod lens system, but gosh, that's a pretty darn good picture if you do endoscopic surgery. The funny thing is, I have these people, they want me to use their, they, they want me to promote their endoscope, and they don't even provide me with an endoscope. I'm just thinking out loud, I won't tell you who they are, but they're like, hey, why don't you use our endoscope? And I have an answer for them, but I won't say it over the air. I mean, if you want me to use your endoscope, you better give me some endoscopes to play with, see if I like them. You know, I'm not going to promote a product that I don't believe in. So, right, Luis? This is beautiful. Very happy with what we're seeing here and the undulations of the herniation, the, the dance, the undulating dance of the herniation. It's quite remarkable. So why does the herniation dance the way it dances?
It's still overexposed. I need the lights down a little bit. Yeah. That's better, yeah. There's some herniation. So why does the herniation dance? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Oh, look at that herniation. Oh, 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 oh. that's a big one. I am hungry. I hope our lunch has arrived. You guys should go eat, by the way. Somebody should go and someone else stay and alternate. Go get some food. I ordered a nice restaurant and save some for Dr. Pettit. One of you guys go. Go get lunch. Huh? Huh? Yeah, all right. So s send somebody. I'm not saying everybody. I'm trying to be, you know, thoughtful and caring and a good boss. You know, it's not easy. I have to overcome a lot of my natural tendencies to lash out at people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, again, we grabbed a bunch of the herniation with a grabber, but you can still see there's a lot there. So we're just going to have to work it down with a laser. So a shout out to Nikos here in Melbourne. If you live in Melbourne, Florida, in the Vieira area, I highly recommend Nikos Restaurant, N-I-K-O-S, the very best food in this county. I had it catered today for lunch, catered for lunch, and uh, treating my staff to some really good food. Huh? What kind of food? Oh, uh, <laughs> do you know? No, no, no. I don't oh. Know. I'm just asking. <laughs> oh, it's no, no, no. Today I ordered something special off the menu. Uh, it's Mexican food, tacos. Yeah, it's Taco Tuesday. Oh, wait a second. It's not Tuesday. Oh shoot. No, I'm kidding. It's tacos. Chicken and steak tacos. I'm sorry to all the vegetarians out there. I do apologize, <laughs> but my God, I had them for the first time yesterday, and the meat has, is perfect. It's so delicious. It has no fat, no gristle. It's incredible, the quality. Sorry I'm talking about food, but it is lunchtime, and you guys aren't asking questions like you should be. So it's, it's Mexican food today for my staff from Nikos, who can cook anything. He made me Indian food the other day, as a matter of fact. I had uh, chicken tikka masala, and it was really good, except it wasn't spicy enough. But that's because my mom doesn't eat spicy. Speaking of my mom, we need to check on her and see how she's doing. which I'll do shortly. Oh, look at that. By the way, my mom is treated at Duke Spine. She's a patient. My own mother. We charge her double for everything. And we don't give her any, any anesthesia when we do her procedures. She wants to keep coming back and I keep trying, trying to discourage her. I'm kidding, of course. I'm sure I'll get some complaint from somebody about how cruel and inhuman I am. Zach, by the way, help yourself to some of the Mexican food. Zach just came back to rejoin Duke Spine Institute. And uh, we've got two employees now with Z, Z names, right? Zach and Zane. <laughs> Almost sounds like a child's parable. Zach and Zane. So we got Zane and we got Zach. And uh, we are very happy that Zach is back. Zach is the one who developed our app, the Duke Spine Institute app. For those of you who don't know, we have an app. And the app is available free online on your phone and for Androids and for Apple, for iPhones and, and Apple. Sorry, iPhones and uh, Android phones. We don't charge to download the app. 
We don't charge to use the app. It's completely free and it has a lot of really good information. So I highly recommend it. We're also in the process of developing a Roku channel for those of you who missed it earlier. Roku, as many of you know, is uh, in a television channel and we're going to have a Duke Spine Institute Roku channel that will broadcast worldwide surgeries and commentaries and interviews and uh, lectures on topics related to the spine by world-renowned doctors besides me. We have one of the best interventional pain management docs in the world here, Dr. Patel. And we're going to be broadcasting um, on Roku, lots of content all related to the spine. So be ready for that. I don't know how long will that take, Zach? Six months? Shorter? Uh, probably shorter, but we'll see. <laughs> all right. Uh, Zach is also going to be producing some special video animations to help people understand back problems and neck problems and treatments. Animations are wonderful tools for uh, educating, especially when you're dealing with three-dimensional things, three-dimensionality. Three-dimensionality is important in surgery. Mm. So all surgeons really need a good three-dimensional understanding of the anatomy of what they're dealing with. That's mm. honestly in medical school, um, it's called gross anatomy. You've probably heard the show, but it's a class where we learn the anatomy of the body, the human body. We look at all the organs and tissues and how they related to each other, how they're structured. And uh, that's really the, it's not my saying, but in medical school, if, if you want to be a surgeon, you got to take anatomy seriously and learn it. Because if you don't learn your anatomy, you can't do surgery very well. You're not going to make it as a surgeon. Surgeons have to have a good understanding of three-dimensional anatomy and how st structures relate to each other in space. All right, any questions from our audience? None others currently. None currently, all right, then I will digress. So my daughter, uh, <laughs> God bless her, I love her to death, Ariana. <laughs> Started driving <laughs> last week or two weeks ago, was it? She got her permit. She'll hate me for saying this, but she still needs to learn the difference between the brake and the gas pedal. So if anyone wants to see the result of mistaking one for the other, just look at my car. <laughs> <laughs> the whole front end is been rearranged yesterday. Huh? My rover, yeah. My Range Rover. Yep, it has a new look and it's unique. I will say the artist was my daughter. She did in a rearrangement. <clears throat> you know how you always wonder what it feels like when you're sitting in a car if somebody hits the accelerator rather than the brake? <laughs> well, we were in my garage, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, let's just say she rearranged the car and the wall. <laughs> I don't mean to throw her under the bus and, and I don't want to hurt her feelings. She was very apologetic, but it's okay. I told her, don't worry about it. It's just a car and, uh, but I do have to get that repaired now. Um, I think both my kids, Arius too, rearranged the side of my car one time. He's going to hate me for saying this, but I'm hoping someday they're watching these videos and they can laugh about it. 
But my son, who's actually a professional race car driver, uh, among other things, he, he scraped the front of my car against the side of the garage going backing out. You know, when you're beginning to drive, one of the things you don't think about when you're backing out is the front of your car. All the focus and attention is on the rear. And what's going on in the rear, but you have to pay attention to the front because it goes the opposite direction of the rear, obviously. Anyway, that said, it's fine. I told you, if you don't ask me questions, I'll start to digress. This area of the disc right here is definitely got more scar tissue. You see all this stuff, the golden, hard, whitey, golden stuff, like kind of a cream color. That's all collagenized herniation. And I've got to try to get it out, as much of it as I can. I'm gonna go lateral as well. Remove herniation laterally. Probably got five minutes, doctor. A California five minutes. I know this patient has family here and they're all watching the surgery, I believe. And I don't know if they have any questions they want to ask me before we wrap things up. But if you have questions, feel free to type it into the chat dialog. We've, uh, I have to give a lot of credit to Sean, Sean Hanneman, who uh, works in our um, media and marketing division. And Sean has been busy making changes to the format of these broadcasts. And I think there's, there's a huge improvement. He's been working with Zach and Sonny as well, but mostly spearheaded by Sean. So if you can appreciate the new look, to our broadcast. That's compliments of Sean's ingenuity and aptitude and insights. So I was pleased when I saw it. And we're gonna continue to add more content with Zach contributing those videos. And uh, Sean has some really neat ideas for enhancing the learning experience with these broadcasts. So if you enjoyed today's broadcast, be sure to join us in the future. By the way, we broadcast all of our surgeries at Duke Spine every week, live, not just lasers, but also fusions. We just don't have any fusions this week. Next week, Next week apparently we do, right? Yes, sir. Posterior cervical fusion. Yes, sir. Yeah, posterior cervical decompression and fusion. We've done those before. We're the only facility in the world that does outpatient posterior cervical laminectomy, foraminotomy, and instrumented fusion. The only in the world that broadcasts that and does it, and does those surgeries outpatient. They're all done in the hospital where people get infections and other complications. We've been doing C3 to 7 laminectomy with foraminotomy and instrumented fusion using lateral mass screws, pedicle screws, down to T2 uh, for seven years now. We've been doing this surgery, seven years. And we've had zero complications and all of our patients go home two hours after the surgery is done. So if you tune in next week, if you're interested in watching a spinal fusion, um, we're gonna be doing that surgery next week, right? Sean, maybe you can Tell them when it is. I think it's on Tuesday, right? I believe so. Um, if you check our calendar on our webpage, I'll post the link in the chat now. It'll show you all of our upcoming surgery live streams. And we also have a question from the audience member. Sure. Just about done. Less than five minutes. Take the question. All right. One of our viewers on Facebook says, I have herniations at T5-6, T6-7, and T11-12. I've done all kinds of therapy, but nothing has worked so far. Is this surgery an option for me? Okay, great question. Yes, this surgery is definitely your best option. Um, so we have a patient with symptomatic, I assume. Her Are we running low on our irrigation? Yeah, I need another bag. I know we're almost done, but I need to see what I'm doing. Thank you. So uh, 
The question is, is this surgery a good option? And the answer is 100% yes. This is the surgery you want. The alternative surgeries, if anybody even offers it to you, are much more invasive and involve fusing with screws and rods and horrible, painful incisions called thoracotomies with resection of ribs, and then you get pain afterwards, uh, thoracic neuralgia, and all kinds of problems with your internal organs because you gotta collapse the lung and move it over and all this stuff. So the best surgery in the world for thoracic disc herniation is what you're watching right now. There's nothing even close. Huh? Thanks, new bag, great, just about done. So yes, this surgery, w why am I, I thought you already pumped it in. Why am I getting bubbles? Huh? All right. So we are inside the disc at T1112, just the outer part, just before we exit the disc. This is really literally the surface of the disc. This is the end of the tear. This is the end of the herniation. And I'm just trying to get over to the middle as much as I can safely and remove this interposed herniation. This is the annular fibers that were torn to allow the herniation to occur. The laser fibers at mid midline. The spinal cord is over there, just past the tube. And this is so scarred right here. You see all this? Incredible. We're right at the apex of the herniation. Those are fibers right there are the fibers of the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament, very scarred up. The spinal cord is just a millimeter or two beyond that uh, at the roof. And this is just a mess. I'm almost done. Probably one minute, I imagine. I have a good imagination, by the way. In case you haven't noticed. Eesh, what is that? That's it. Pretty cool. We are in the foramen. And I am zapping the last of the herniation from the foramen. Done. Nice work, everyone. I thought the surgery went pretty well. I mean, it could, could not have gone better. Let's put it that way. I'm gonna show everybody what we've done. We've already done some diagrams on the skin. I mean, not on the skin, but on the drapes. And uh, I'm gonna show you the incisions that we did the surgery with. Oh, let me just show them everything here. Let me have that tube here. For those of you who joined us late, can you see that, Sean? The whole surgery was done through two incisions. They're four millimeters each and a small tube, endoscopic tube called the tubular tractor. And for those of you wanting to see our rig, this is our rig right here, the endoscopic rig. And when somebody asked a question earlier about damaging their rig, this is what they're talking about, damaging this part of the rig. You have irrigation coming in from the side, and we have uh, the laser fiber that goes through there. You have a light source right here, and we have the, the camera, which attaches to the back of the scope right here. This is a high-definition camera. Again, only the best equipment. And then of course, you have two incisions, one here. You guys see that? Right there? Yes, we do. That's four millimeters and probably four or five millimeters there. And no hematoma, the muscles are supple. 
Everyone did a phenomenal job today. We've got one more laser surgery coming after this, and it's lumbar, which is, which is um, not as exciting as thoracic, <laughs> right? And of course, we've got Mexican food for lunch. So if you're in the area and you want to stop by, Duke Spine Institute. everyone, Dr. Duke will be joining us in the room shortly. Post any remaining questions you have in the chat and he will answer them soon. Come on. I feel, I really feel great. I mean, well, before the operation, I could only walk up maybe 100 feet and I had to go back in the house. Now I can walk pretty much two miles every morning. In fact, they marvel at me at the gym that I'm able to do what I can do there. I'm kind of an inspiration for a lot of people at the gym. <laughs> My name is Greg Spadaro. Um, this is my father, Jack Spadaro. We are from Connecticut. We moved down here. For me, it's been about 20 years. I think my father's been down here a good 24 years now. And uh, we've been two individuals that have kind of suffered with back pain and problems for a good portion of our lives. My situation started back in 1964. I had uh, an injury bowling in uh, it was not a, not a serious injury, but someone at the time recommended me going to a chiropractor at that time. And uh, I went to this guy and I went to see him and he uh, ended up uh, rupturing my disc. It was the first operation. It was a neurosurgeon in Hartford, Connecticut named Dr. Scoville. And he did an excellent job. And for years after that, I was fine until I got here in Florida again and my back problems started again. But uh, we went up to uh, Tampa and I had several uh, laser surgeries done, which actually only aggravated my situation. And then locally we had a neurosurgeon here that uh, became well, well uh, respected as, as, as an excellent surgeon and he operated on me twice. And my situation only got worse. Uh, I, had, I was bent over with the pain in my left side for a long time, almost two years. And then I heard my son telling me about uh, Dr. Duke. And uh, so I ended up going up to see Dr. Duke and explained my situation to him, how I, I was uh, in such pain and such. And he, he took an x-ray and evaluated me and he showed me on the x-ray how my operation had actually had come apart. The diffusion that they, they did locally here had come apart and it was the, the nerve was being impinged on by the, uh, the bone. So um, he recommended to me that, he, that we needed to be operated on and he told me what he was going to do and how he was going to do it and that, uh, that he felt he could help me. He was so convincing 
And I was so desperate at that point because of the pain I was in that, that I ended up going ahead and, and we did the operation. He did uh, S, L2 to S, S, S1. So four levels. And it was a major operation. And uh, thank God, uh, thank Dr. Duke that he gave my lifestyle back again because from the, from the moment after we came, we came out of the, uh, the uh, recovery room, I was able to stand straight. I told my, even that time, even though I was still under anesthesia, I said, I could feel him standing straight with no pain. He even made me dance a little bit at that point in time, you know, which was kind of funny, you know, but uh, I've never, I, outside of the, uh, I've never taken any pain pills. I mean, it's amazing with the kind of pain that I had originally. That after the operation, it was totally gone. And uh, so from my standpoint, my lifestyle is back. I stand straight, I have no pain. I go to the gym twice a week. I walk every day, and there's very few things that I can't do at this point in time, especially at 80 years old. I'm very proud to say that. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't stand and hold him like this before the operation. Come on. I feel, I really feel great. I mean, well, before the operation, I could only walk up maybe 100 feet and I had to go back in the house. Now I could walk pretty much two miles every morning. In fact, they marvel at me at the gym that I'm able to do what I can do there. I'm kind of an inspiration for a lot of people at the gym. <laughs> I still do all the, all the maintenance of the house myself. I do the lawn. Fertilize. I, do, I trim the bushes. I do the pool. Uh, I, I do pretty much everything. The fact that I can do this now uh, is, is unbelievable. I couldn't walk. I couldn't lift a finger until uh, until I had the operation. It's easy to recommend to Dr. Duke and his staff up there because they're professional in every stance of the word. Uh, my operation, as I say, it, it was a big operation. And uh, as far as pain medicine, I didn't have to take any pain medicine after, after the operation, which was significant because I'm allergic to pain medicine, which causes other problems for me. So I would recommend Dr. Duke and his staff uh, without reservation.
All right. Hello, everyone. It's April Fool's Day, but we're not fooling around here at Duke's Spine Institute. We are taking on the most complicated herniated discs in the spine, and we are winning. We just finished a bilateral Duke laser disc repair for a herniated disc at T1112 in a young man who comes to us from California. He's an engineer. I can't tell you anything more about him except that he's had pain in his thoracic area for about two years. And more importantly, the spinal cord was getting crushed by the herniation. It was a big herniation and it was pushing on things from both sides. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, we'll use this little model so I could use this to illustrate what we did. There's a bone here called the vertebrae, another vertebrae, and between them is a little cushion called a disc. The disc has two parts. It has an outer part that's really tough and strong, and it holds the jelly part in the center. However, some people get injuries to their discs. Let's take this disc, for example. Turn it on its side so you can better understand. The jelly is colored red, just so you can see the difference between the jelly and the outer part called the annulus fibrosus. So people get tears in their annulus fibrosus, and then it lets the jelly push out through that tear. And that's what this patient we just did had. But his tear was on both sides of the back of the disc. So the spinal cord was getting pushed on. You can see the yellow thing is a spinal cord there, right there. It was getting pushed on by the herniated disc from both sides, okay? So I went in on both sides and we attacked the herniation on both sides to debulk it and get the pressure off the spinal cord. Patient's doing fantastic. He's in recovery, so we'll check on him in a little bit. If you have any questions, type them up now. Otherwise, I'm Dr. R. Gignasian. We just completed a bilateral T1112 transforaminal endoscopic disc repair called the Duke Laser Disc Repair with annular debridement at T1112. And uh, don't forget to download the Duke Spine Institute app. It's free for your phone, and it allows you to connect to Duke Spine and all of our programming, a lot of valuable information. Also, we have a Facebook group in case you like Facebook and you want to get online onto Facebook and interact with our doctors and staff and other people who have back and neck problems related to their spines. It's called the Spine Surgery Support Group. Spine Surgery Support Group. We just surpassed 700 members. It's a new Facebook group, so our numbers are not so big, but we don't allow trolling. We don't allow advertising or false advertising of any type. And it's really just a forum for people to exchange factual ideas about how to care for their spines or someone else's spine issue. I talk about surgeries they've had or issues they're having and how to get resolution of those issues. So it's really a, a place for people to come and share ideas in a positive and truthful atmosphere. And if I see you trolling it, we're going to get rid of you very quickly. Um, thank you.